What's up, Simonies? Welcome back to a new Ionic vlog. This week, we're gonna talk about Ionic best practices because recently I released a new course inside the Ionic Academy. If you're not yet a member, make sure to check it out, ionicacademy.com. It is basically a 35 pages long guide about different Ionic best practices. And today I wanna present you five of the tips and areas discussed in that guide so you can build better Ionic applications. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the architecture. I will talk about Angular, uh, you can use Vue and React as well, but for now, uh, most of my videos are focused on Angular, so I will also only talk about the Angular architecture. Basically, Angular already gives you like the perfect architecture if you use the Ionic CLI, which under the hood anyway uses the Angular CLI. But the first thing you can think about when inspecting your project is how you would like to separate the different files. Angular actually recommends to have a folder by feature structure, which means you have like the top app and then you have perhaps something about the login, a dashboard, an admin area, um, anything you could think of and within them you would have all the relevant files for that feature. Something else that you usually see in my videos is like a folder by function uh, setup where you have the services, the pages, the directives, um, the custom components, something like this. There's actually no right or wrong. It's really just about finding a structure that helps you to navigate as fast as possible through your project and have as little levels as possible. So you don't wanna have a folder inside a folder and another folder just to find one specific component or function for something. You wanna have everything as flat as possible inside your project so you or your co-workers can find the relevant code as fast as possible. On top of that, the Angular architecture already is separated in different elements. So you can have modules, you can have pages, you can have services, directives, um, standalone components, which are a bit different to the Ionic page compo uh, construct. But in general, it is highly recommended to use all of them. Of course, you can simply go ahead, you generate one page, you perform every kind of operation, logic, HTTP request, data storage, everything in that one page. But that is really a very, very bad idea. Whenever possible, try to uh, move the relevant code into services which act like a single and can be injected into different pages. Uh, if you need to transform elements in your template, you can use pipes, you can use directives. You should really embrace the different elements that Angular gives you, um, structure your code into modules that you can import and lazy load to really get the most out of Angular to have the best kind of architecture and also to reduce the load time if you separate everything into modules and not uh, load one giant file in the beginning. The second tip for the best practices involves coding. First of all, a very basic thing, use a decent IDE. I always use Visual Studio Code in my videos. You've seen it, you asked a lot about the theme and the colors and everything but that's not super important. It's really important to have a good IDE. It doesn't have to be Visual Studio Code. There are other great IDEs. Uh, I used Atom in the past, I used WebStorm. Um, I think I even used Sublime at some point. There are really a lot of great editors. If you want to have something that works great, has great options for extensions and is free, give Visual Studio Code a try. But please don't write it inside a text file where you have no kind of linting. I really very often get problems um, that I would immediately see in my IDE because of the TypeScript interfaces using promises wrong or any kind of stuff that could be easily prevented with the right IDE. And speaking of TypeScript, I really recommend that you embrace TypeScript as good as possible. When you get started with Angular, uh, you might actually fear that you have to learn TypeScript, but I never really felt like I have to learn TypeScript. It's just an addition to JavaScript any Anyway, I can basically build Angular Ionic applications without knowing a thing about TypeScript at all. Most of the stuff that you can use with TypeScript in your application is completely optional, but still I highly recommend it. For example, you have a function that is a bit bigger and returns something. If you use it in another file, you actually don't really know what that function is going to return. And that's especially a problem if you're working with a team and others are using things that you defined in your services. So for all functions, you should definitely add the return type. Um, you should specify 
which type the parameters should have. Um, whenever using variables in your classes, you should as good as possible say of which type these variables are, which once again, just like the IDE, removes a lot of the trouble that you can get while writing your code. I don't wanna get too much into coding, but just a quick word on async await. There are different ways to use promises. Um, there are also observables, and you should really know about how to use them. There's a different way to handle a promise and an observable. You don't need to be an RxJS master to make an HTTP call, but it's really a recommendation to get a little bit used to, first of all, in general, the concept of async code, which might be new for uh, developers coming from other languages, and then also understanding the differences of observables and promises. I had also planned a little vlog on this, so if you're interested in a little deep dive on promises, observables, and how to handle them correctly, please let me know below the video and I'm happy to create another bigger guide on that topic. Best practice area number three is about the bundle size of your Ionic application. You should really care about the bundle size of your application for one very important reason, and that is the loading time of your application. In general, Ionic applications load very fast. But if you're loading like 100 files on startup because you're not lo uh, using lazy loading, uh, you have a lot of code in the constructors, you're performing async operations right in the beginning that block your application, then you can't really blame Ionic or Angular for your app being slow. It's really about uh, decreasing the bundle size of your Ionic application. There are tools, uh, Matt had a great uh, tutorial on that post where he introduced a cool tool called Source Map Explorer, which uh, basically helps you to show a preview of um, the different packages used inside your application and how big they are inside the final bundle. When you see uh, some package inside there that you're actually not using or that you're perhaps importing everything from, uh, although you just need a tiny fraction of it, then this tool can really help to uh, decrease your bundle size first of all. With that being said, there are different other areas like don't include huge images inside your application, uh, which make first of all the download from the App Store uh, a lot slower, but also of course loading the images will take longer. So also try to decrease the size of your images in your application if you have a lot of images in the assets folder. On top of that, there's also something called Angular budget that you can include inside your Angular JSON that will print out an error or warning once you are above a certain threshold. So you can define like uh, above 500 kilobytes per component, uh, you should throw a warning. This helps you to automatically when you run an Ionic build in the end, to see that some components or some services exceed that budget. When they exceed this budget, it's easier for you to find out in which area of your application you might think twice and improve something, uh, because otherwise you wouldn't really notice how big a component or a service get, but with Angular budgets, you can always keep an eye on this whenever you run an Ionic build. And of course, as a final improvement, Always, when you submit your app or build a native application or upload it as a website, use dash dash prod to run a production build, which automatically triggers some uh, improvements like to minify your code, to uglify, I think uglify is called, uh, to concat CSS, and in general, improve your code by removing unused snippets. Really important in the end, always run a production build uh, if you want to use that code for a real application. Best practice number four to keep an eye on is the Angular lifecycle and the Ionic lifecycle. When you create a new page or a new component, you got a constructor and that looks like a cool place to put all your uh, init logic in there. Well, it turns out that's not really the best place because for example, if you want to access a view child with Angular, that actually is not defined inside the constructor. So you need to rely on events like Ion view did enter or ng on init, ng after init, which are really the events broadcasted from Angular or Ionic um, that give you a lot more information about the status of your application. The constructor of your class is basically just a JavaScript construct which is called whenever that page is bootstrap, really the first thing that is called when your class is called. And therefore inside the constructor really just put the minimum amount, uh, like only the initialization for uh, specific variables, if you haven't added that at the top of your class, and don't perform any kind of HTTP request or other uh, async operations in there. Move that to the appropriate functions of the Angular or Ionic lifecycle. 
Best practice tip number five is stay up to date, which isn't uh, very easy given the pace of JavaScript packages and everything used in your application uh, being outdated after like a week. But I highly recommend to uh, at least follow the development of the Angular versions and of Ionic. If there's a new uh, minor uh, or patch version of Ionic, you can uh, basically always just update to that version, which usually includes some improvements or some minor bug fixes. For Angular, it's kind of the same, but you should just uh, upgrade once there's a new major version for Angular. For example, right now, they move from Angular 10 to Angular 11, and with Angular 11, you get a lot of benefits like better locks once you run a console build, they got the hot module replacement, um, they have certain other internal optimizations, which actually make uh, Ionic Surf and the reload a lot faster. So these are benefits that you can get from updating, and right now the update for Angular was really running one script to update the core and CLI of Angular, and one script to update the Ionic Angular toolkit. That's really everything, and there's no major migration, although this was a new major Angular version. But the same is true for other packages. Uh, once your app gets to a certain level, there are really like 20 different or 30 dependencies inside your package JSON, and you can't really see if all of them are up to date or got uh, important security bug fixes. But for this, there's actually another tool that you can run which uh, prints out all the new versions available for the different packages, which is also able to update all of them. Um, this is not safe to use because um, it doesn't really care about if your code might break, so it just knows about the new versions. But uh, if you have Git or any kind of repository, uh, it's quite easy to just give this a try, update all dependencies and see if your app is still working. If it is still working, great, you're on the very latest version of everything and if not, you might have to fix uh, something here and there. But overall, it's really important to stay up to date with the most important part of your application, that is the JavaScript framework, Angular, React, View, and Ionic and perhaps as well Capacitor because these are really the elements that can uh, make or break your application. Um, as you can see, Angular 11 really gives a very big boost to the development speed with hot module uh, replacement or in general, the live reload is a lot faster. Uh, once you see new major Ionic versions, um, there might be parts that you have to really migrate, but uh, currently Angular is really a very smooth upgrade most of the time. Make sure you stay up to date to get the benefits of the latest versions of your package just used in your Ionic application. All right, I hope you enjoyed these best practices about Ionic. I hope this gives you an idea in different uh, areas to improve the Ionic apps that you're building or that you have built in the past to perhaps revisit them about a few of these key points. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the like button. I don't know which direction they are to never miss any of my upcoming Ionic tutorials and vlog videos because I got really a lot planned for the next time. So finally, would you like to see more about one of these areas? Um, perhaps dive into more about performance or architecture or any of this? Please let me know in the comments and if you got any questions, of course, as always, leave them below as well. We will also soon have a new app review, so if you've released any Ionic apps recently, also make sure to leave them in the comments, which hopefully blows up the whole comment section for this video. And then I hope you have a great week of awesome Ionic apps with great clean code and perfect architecture, and I will catch you next week, like always. So, have a great week and happy coding, Simon.